Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Della Croto on faculty here at uh, Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy, subbing in for uh, Lubin Austin today. The title of our presentation is Revisiting Our Past to Shape Our Future, a, a Historical View of Professional Identity in Pharmacy. And uh, we have two presenters today. Our presenter in person is Dr. Jamie Keller, and our discussant will be Nancy Waite. So introducing Jamie, um, she is received both her Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy and her PharmD degrees from the University of Toronto. She joined the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy in 2011 as a clinical educator, and then in 2015 moved into a full-time assistant professor teaching stream position. Professor Keller's practice area is in the field of mental health and addictions, and she has brought her clinical passion to the classroom. Professor Keller has a strong interest in education scholarship and leadership, as evidenced by her current role as acting director of the Doctor of Pharmacy program and her pursuit of a PhD in health professions education at Master University in the Netherlands. Jamie's presentation will explore the professional identity of pharmacists over the last century in North America. She will present the results from her PhD work, which critically examines identity discourses from a historical per perspective. Findings from Jamie's study illustrate multiple identity discourses at play in pharmacy education, which impact identity formation for the profession as a whole. This presentation will illustrate how understanding the past can provide valuable insight to reshape pharmacy's future. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Ellie. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so oh, maybe oh, there we go. This is um, just some acknowledgments. This is actually the first study um, out of my PhD studies on professional identity in pharmacy education, and I'm actually super excited because it's finally been accepted for publication last week. So um, this one has been a struggle to publish um, as a result of the critical lens that I've taken, I think, most likely. But anyway, it is now going to get out there for the world to see, um, hopefully in the next month or so. So I'm going to actually talk about professional identity specifically in education, but I'm going to talk about how that then impacts practice or some of the things we need to think about between the connections between education and practice. And I'm actually going to do that from a historical perspective. I've looked at 100 years of data, roughly, um, that said, I promise it will not be a boring history lesson, or at least I hope not. Um, I'll highlight the purpose of doing it from a historical lens and some of the insights that that affords. So professional identity formation is actually gaining traction as a movement in medical education. Um, there's a underpinning in the literature for sure over the last 10 to 15 years, maybe even a bit longer in medicine, but you can also see it in nursing as well as other health professions that professional identity actually should be the backbone of all educational programs. All of our curriculum should be around, designed around not content, but who we are becoming as professionals. And so it's really a movement in educational reform that has gained a lot of traction except in pharmacy. There is a significant paucity of research that has looked at this from an empirical lens. We've said a lot. There is a lot of commentaries around pharmacists and their identity. Um, however, much of it is actually rhetoric. It's a lot of talk and not a lot of data to support many of the thoughts and ideas. And so I'm starting to take a stab at some of the things that are, are there over the last century. How many people have heard that practice is changing? Yeah, me too. How many people have heard that for longer than we'd like to admit? And so have I, and so have our students actually at this point already. And so, although I agree that practice has changed over the last century, and I'm not suggesting that it hasn't, but what I'll suggest is that it hasn't changed at the rate that we think that it should have, or sometimes the rate that we talk about it at. And again, it goes back to pharmacists as a profession seem to be very good at being visionary about talking about where we'd like to go, yet the actual delivery of that has been a challenge. 
And there's been a number of reasons why we've talked about why we can't specifically transform to a clinical identity, which is certainly what we've been working towards over the last, what some people will say 10, 15 years. When you read the archive, it's been close to 100 years. And I'll show you some of that data. And we've looked at why is that? Well, pharmacists have said, well, if I can do it, I would. So we changed scope and law. And now we can do lots of things. But the law changed and our scopes changed. And many of us didn't change. We've said, well, we don't have enough time. So we've regulated technicians. We've added places where pharmacists work um, in teams. Yet even with more time, never enough time, but even with more time, practice hasn't really changed. We've talked about workflows and we've changed those in a number of different ways. We've talked about not being remunerated for the services and now we pay for them in some cases, yet we still don't do them at nearly the rate that you would think that we could. So I'm going to argue that I wonder if maybe it's not about barriers and in that case, it's not even about facilitators. I'm wondering if what one of the problems could be is that we actually don't have clinical identities. You cannot enact a way of being if it's not part of your cognitive schema or part of your mental map. And so part of our challenge from practice change could in fact be implicated by professional identity or in our case, a lack of a clinician identity. And those things actually matter from an educational perspective as well as a practice evolution perspective. And it's why we need to start to, from my perspective, invest more research, particularly in the identity aspects of our profession. And so I would actually argue that pharmacy is experiencing somewhat of an identity crisis. And we are certainly from an educational perspective, and I would say probably as leaders across the profession, seeking a clinician identity. That has been our mandate um, across North America since the beginning of the clinical pharmacy movement in the early 1960s, and certainly even more so with the pharmaceutical care movement beginning in the late 1980s, early 1990s. The challenge though, is that we've not actually adopted any single identity and we're stuck between identities. And I'm gonna show you how my data supports that. And so I think part of our identity crisis and our lack of having a clinician identity and a way of enacting or being clinicians impacts practice change at the level that we'll see it. And I'm gonna talk about some of the implications for that to the profession at the end. So to put sort of identity into context and sort of how I looked at it, all of us have an identity. We all have a personal identity, which is who we are and who we're seen to be as individuals. So our professional identity, broadly speaking, is who we are in the context of our chosen profession. So for many of us, that's who we are in the context of being pharmacists. Interestingly, there's actually no definition of what it means to be a pharmacist from a professional identity in our profession at all. And this is in stark contrast to what you find in medicine. And so from a medical lens, the current trendy definition of what it means to be a physician is a representation of self achieved in stages over time during which the characteristic values and norms of the medical profession are internalized, resulting in an individual thinking, acting, and feeling like a physician. So this is the backbone of all medical education across North America, to the point that they've amended Miller's Pyramid with a new apex that's called being. So it's no longer enough to know how, show how, do. You now need to be. And so that's how much this has actually shifted in terms of how we're thinking about the importance of this identity component to our professions. This is actually a definition from Richard uh, and Sylvia Cruz and a Weinstein Steinart out of McGill Medical School. And when we think about an identity, you need to be able to form an identity. So professional identity formation, there's a number of ways to think about it. In keeping with the Cruz's definition, they think about identity as a developmental process, so a cognitive developmental psychology lens. Sandra Jarvis Selinger is actually a, psycho a psychologist, but she's also the Associate Dean of Pharmacy um, at UBC. And she describes identity as a developmental process in which it's really this adaptive developmental process that happens simultaneously at two levels. So there's the level of the individual, and that includes the psychological development, the integration of your profession with your individual being. And then there's a collective level. And this is the level that I'm interested in, which is the socialization or the collective development of identities. And that's how you socialize individuals through usually education or communities of practice to a collective way of being. And that's what education does. We socialize students and construct identities through interaction with the social world, in our case, classrooms, rotations, et cetera. 
as I said, there's very little work that has been done in identity in pharmacy at all. One of the biggest papers and one of literally a handful of empiric studies that have looked at identity in pharmacy was done by Rebecca Elvey and colleagues um, from Manchester in the UK. And she used an interview, qualitative interview um, approach to assessing pharmacists to describe their identities. She looked at practicing pharmacists, both hospital and community pharmacists, covering a spectrum from new graduates all the way to mid-career, and asked them about their identity. And this is what she found. This study was done in 2013-2014, um, so it's relatively new. Anyone want to guess which one was the most common identity that pharmacists uniformly identified with? Medicine supplier was right up there, yeah? Dispenser comes up. It's actually scientist. Pharmacists across the board identified as being scientists. Medicine supplier and medicine dispenser were the next two. And clinical pharmacist or clinician was almost at the bottom. And this was in 2013. And I would argue that the UK from an education and practice perspective is not that different than North America. They have masters of pharmacy programs instead of doctor of pharmacy programs as the entry to practice requirements. But they've been seeking expanded scope prescribing rights across, their, um, across the UK for many years as well. And so even though we've been talking about the same kinds of practice change towards this clinical pharmacy practice, pharmacists, including those that had recently graduated, still predominantly identify as scientists, as well as medicine suppliers and medicine dispensers. The hospital pharmacist, if you break up the group, had the highest affiliation towards a clinical orientation, but it still was not, when you actually look at her data and the assessment, fully clinical. There were still some aspirational aspects to that. So I'm not going to tell you how I got here and sort of what all of my data shows. And so and the, my story will just give you a context for how I approached the data set and how I ended up doing a PhD at this stage in my career, which I still sometimes wonder what the heck was I thinking. Um, so I came back to, I was a pharmacist, I worked in mental health for a number of years, did some degrees here, came back and did my PharmD and got hired as a clinician educator after I finished that in 2011. And I felt really great to have the title. I was like one of the first ones and I said, yes, I'm a clinician educator. And then I thought, uh-oh, am I actually either of those things? I'm not actually sure I'm a clinician and I sure as heck wasn't trained to be an educator. And so I started to think about language and how we use language to create legitimacy. Because I started to think, well, it sounds great to be a clinician educator. Actually, sounds better than telling people I'm a pharmacist, because most people don't know what that is, and it requires an awful lot of explanation. And it actually sounds better than saying, well, I'm a pharmacy teacher. So I started to wonder how we pick words. And I started to pay attention, because I've heard a number of pharmacists say things like, well, I'm a staff pharmacist, or I'm just a pharmacist. And that's concerning, I think, from an identity perspective. I've never heard a physician say, well, I'm just a doctor, if they're a family doc, not a surgeon but this has come, become part of our lexicon across our profession. And you can actually see it when you analyze the qualitative data. So I decided to take a critical look at where we are as a profession from an identity perspective, starting specifically with education. And I chose to study discourse and how we use language to create legitimacy and to look at power structures within the language. For this, I actually used a Foucauldian uh, theoretical approach so for those of you who don't know, Michel Foucault was a prominent French scholar um, who used a lot of historical discourse analysis as one of the main ways that he looked at a number of things. Um, his most famous work was actually his PhD work where he studied madness or mental health. And he looked at the discourses, how they shifted over time with madness as spiritual possession to madness as deviant behavior to current day madness or mental health as an actual health disorder. And those things have all been the same historically, but the discourse around them and how we conceptualize them has changed through constructions in society. So I looked at how specific discourses around pharmacist identity were constructed in pharmacy education literature over the last 100 years in North America. And I looked at it as a social construction and a, I used a post-structuralist approach, meaning that language is constructed through interactions between institutions, practices, and people. And in order to understand objects, you need to understand the knowledge systems that allow them to be created. And now I'm going to put it into context for those of you that have no idea what I just said because you don't know Foucault or you're not so into that theoretical basis. 
This is actually a slide courtesy of Dr. Brian Hodges, who does a lot of work with Foucault. And it also makes you smile in the middle of the presentation because it's cute. What is this? It's a dog. What else is it? A golden retriever, it's a type of dog. What else? A pet, awesome, what else? A friend, there you go, what else? A fur baby, okay. Therapy, so it's actually an occupation um, or an employee. In some countries, it's food. So, fair enough, we don't need to go there. <laughs> A lot of people crunched up. So my point is that you look at this and each of those discourses for what we call a dog, a mammal, a golden retriever, make different subjects and objects possible. So dog as pet creates an entire industry of social structures. It allows us to hire doggy daycares. It allows doggy grooming services. It allows an entire section in Yorkville for pet attire that you can dress your dog in, push your dog in a stroller. All of those things aren't actually possible without the construction of dog as pet. Dog as food creates a whole other set of industries. Dog as employee or therapy, again, creates another way of thinking about it. Those discourses all have different power relationships within our current society, and depending on how you see them, determine how you actually approach or interact with them. So I did the same thing with pharmacists and their identity. And so I did that using serial history and archeology. span And so one thing that's really important when you think about a Foucauldian approach to historical analysis is that Foucault doesn't actually view history as progressive. Nothing is evolution or better than or worse than because it's through time. It's based on society constructs and what's current in the moment. And so I think when we think about mankind and the fact that we now walk upright, we think that's somehow progressive or better than our ancestors that walked on four legs. Foucault would say, nope, the world just changed and we had to adapt. And so what I'm gonna argue is that the clinician identity is not progressive. It just is. It's a current construct that allows pharmacists to seek identity and legitimacy, but it's no better or worse than other identity constructs that I found. And the problem with thinking it's progressive is that you take for granted that that is a truth statement that's been constructed in our current world, and it means that you can't see other things as being possible for the profession. And so I use a critical lens to challenge the clinician identity as being progressive with the goal of positive social change to break up this as the only assumption for a legitimate role for a pharmacist in the 21st century. So for a Foucauldian uh, discourse analysis to happen, you need to create an archive, um, in my case, a textual archive. And so I used the American Journal of Pharmacy Edu Pharmaceutical Education from its inception in 1937 until present day. This is the journal that has actually just accepted this paper as well. So that was good news. This was way outside their realm of possible. Uh, the methodology is not something that AJPE typically publishes. Um, so as I said, it just got accepted last week. Um, so the beauty of this particular journal is that it is the biggest uh, pharmacy education journal um, in North America. It also is the place where most conversations happening in the profession went. It published all of the presidential commentaries from AACP and AFPC over the last hundred years. Um, there's a number of addresses from Canadian deans actually um, in this archive. So it has both published empiric data as well as commentaries and editorials reflective of the change in education over the last century. And we had it every single edition at Gerstein in the basement that I could go through page by page. Who knew that when I started? I spent a lot of time in three below the, at uh, Gerstein for anyone that remembers where that is. Our current students have no idea. Um, so I also then from AJPE, I went through, as I said, every issue. Um, from there, I also was able to identify other key educational publications that actually impacted the education conversations, particularly commissioned reports um, that were similar to things like the Flexner Report in Medicine. So in 1910, Carnegie um, paid for a Flexner Report to review medical education. Pharmacy wanted to have that done as well. Carnegie wouldn't pay, so we commissioned our own reports. So the Charters Report, the pharmaceutical, which was done in 1927, the Pharmaceutical Surveys from 1941, the Pharmacists for the Future Report from the early 90s, and then the Commission to Implement Change in Pharmacy Education in the mid-90s, as well as some AFPC documents interspersed in there. There just wasn't many. 
My questions were what have been the professional identity discourses in pharmacy education over the last century in North America and which ones currently dominate? And here's what I found. I actually found five discourses um, within the archive. I found an apothecary discourse, a dispenser discourse, a merchandiser discourse, an expert advisor, and a healthcare provider. The discourses did not come labeled. I did that myself when I put all of the data together. So I'm gonna just give you a highlight of the truth statements around each of these and then tell you what I think they mean at the end. So all of these discourses come with language, symbols, objects, and subjects. And so the apothecary, as many of you can imagine, is the mortar and pestle. Uh, or the medicine shops. Most of us can imagine what that looks like. This identity construct actually is the most, um, has the highest professional status, if you look at it from the whole century. And it's got a lot of autonomy associated with it. It's often referred to as the poor man doctor. And it's at a time when pharmacists were considered to be professional equals to medicine. Um, this actually follows the archive through right into the 1960s where we look at um, the language still talking about the apothecary of being that of a scientist, the poor man's doctor, compounder. The objects made possible are compounded medicines and apprenticeships. This was before formal pharmacy education in universities. And then you could also see it allowed for apprentices and master pharmacists to exist. This specific discourse is present all the way through the archive and it has a very nostalgic tone. It has a those were the good old days. How do we go back there? Because again, of that professional stature. And so here's a quote from 1941, that even the most unpharmaceutical of us, if he's old enough, can remember the apothecary shop with its bottle of colored liquids in the window. Mystery and glamor hovered about such a shop. The apothecary was a man of parts, a man with lore of magic, it seemed. These shops vanished and in their place, we've got drugstores, the kind we joke about that sell everything from bathing suits to sandwiches. Replace what we sell, but you can see this kind of context throughout the 100 years of the archive. The dispenser discourse came next. This kind of was, so this, the apothecary discourse runs from the 1800s into the early 1930s predominantly, and then it appears periodically throughout commentaries. Almost all commentaries somehow go back to the apothecary as the good old days, even in the 1980s and 90s. The dispenser discourse came next. It started in the early 1900s and certainly is present all the way through the archive as well. This image most often associated with this is still an independent pharmacy or a corner drugstore notion. This druggist was an equal man of character and a man of science. They were upstanding parts of the society, pinnacles of their community, places where people went for information of all sorts, not just drugs. And this person was the public health master. They were really proactive in public health, which is very different than today's modern discourse where we provide public health reactively in the archive, but not so much proactively. And again, you can see here is when we started to see a lot of um, the movement towards formal pharmacy education. This is when we actually started to formalize Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy programs across North America. We started graduate programs, and here the pharmaceutical industry was still covering a lot of um, drug discovery type science. It also made possible basic science faculty as well as graduate students. This is where your scientist um, identity that we still see from the Elver, LV paper was born. And again, you can see the dispenser actually had a fairly prominent place. Um, we present a typical pharmacist. He's a man with interests and obligations outside of his profession. Personality and character should be of a high degree of competence sells a wide variety of projects, fills prescriptions, manufactures those that you can't purchase. And again, but a pharmacist must be a scientist, of course. This is heavily rooted in science. And to be fair, what's interesting is that this dispenser identity is actually very important to the, the profession. And so what I say now is that I'm working on a paper called When Did Dispensing Become a Dirty Word? We don't wanna dispense anymore. We talk about it like it's some terrible thing that somebody else should do, and that's not where we started. And so there's a lot of pride in dispensing in this part of the archive that disappears as we go farther along, which is somewhat concerning since this is still a huge part of what we do in many cases. So the merchandiser discourse is the one that comes next. This is where the image of this is the chain pharmacy or corporate pharmacy, and this has a very prominent beginning in the education literature 
specifically. Remember, I only look at education literature. And the chain pharmacist is a business person. And they are a business person seeking a profit at all cost. It's all related to being business, commercially oriented, non-professional commercialism. It makes possible quota systems, retail shopping, department stores, like many of our pharmacies now look. And it creates subjects like corporate owners, pharmacist managers, pharmacy retailers. And this is where you start to see the language around staff pharmacist. I'm just a staff pharmacist. I've labeled this the villain. I did not write that in the paper because people did not like that. So I've had to scale it back a little. The point is still there in my picture. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I think what, when we're looking at it from an education perspective, we're doing these things not on purpose. The language is actually telling a story, but it's telling a story to our students. And so these are some quotes from the merchandiser discourse. And again, we think of corporate pharmacy as being new. The first quote's from 1937, not that new. The development of the chain drugstore idea has been a potent factor in the destruction of the professional ideals and standards in pharmacy. Schools of pharmacy have lent themselves to materialistic demands. Managers for chain stores, may God forbid, there's no analogous situation to this in any other profession. No chain law, no chain medicine, no chain nursing. Why under heavens chain pharmacy? And then this is actually from 2004, corporate cultures and pharmacy practice that don't support pharmacists involvement in progressive patient care due to lack of reimbursement results in pharmacy graduates defaulting back to dispensing roles in the face of the pressures of drug distribution. This is an example of hidden curriculum undoing our strides towards clinical identities and the problem when you've got competing identities that you're not aware of and purposely controlling for. So it creates confusion and ambiguity or ambiguity in our learners. So the next one was an expert advisor discourse. This one is an advice giver. We've all heard of the pharmacist as the knowledge keeper. It's a knowledge system. What was interesting in this discourse is there's no mention of the patient. We were specifically being looked at to provide advice to physicians, mostly, as well as other healthcare providers. And this kind of covered from a period from around the late 1950s into the mid 80s. The problem with this is that the rhetoric in the pharmacy education was very clear that the doctor of the future will need us and more and more they're gonna to look to us for information and we will be that source of solid drug information. The problem was that the doctors didn't see it that way. And in the early time, they actually relied on their detail men, which to us is the pharmaceutical reps and industry as their source of information. And so we were very adamant about this role, but we didn't socialize it into our um, fabric of being so that it translated into medicine and other professions picking it up, which, became a problem again when you're thinking about an, an identity having to be enacted as a way of being. There was a disconnect in terms of how it was perceived by others. And then the last one is not surprising, it's the healthcare provider or the clinician discourse. And this is your current um, identity that's certainly dominant in the literature. And it's related to you know responsibility, accountability, the rational use of drugs, patient-centered care. And again, this makes a whole bunch of other things possible, doctor of pharmacy degrees, advanced training for pharmacists, residency programs, clinical faculty, et cetera. So what the heck does all of this actually mean or matter? I found a whole bunch of identities. So one of the things that was actually interesting and very unexpected was that in traditional Foucauldian analyses, you find identities that shift over time. So in the madness example, Madness is now seen as a mental health disorder. It's no longer seen as spiritual possession and hopefully not as deviant behavior, although there's probably still some folks that would see it that way. But we've had a huge shift. So you can trace in time societal changes that cause the discourses to shift. In pharmacy education, the discourses didn't shift. In fact, they piled up. So I'm calling them discursive pileups for lack of a better word. What does that mean? It means that throughout the entire archive, we brought chunks of the identities with us all the way through. So instead of saying we are going to be clinicians and teach only clinical science, we brought all the basic science and all the dispensing and all of the compounding in little bits with us. And so what happens when you do that, and we've done that in a way that's not necessarily been purposeful around identity formation. And when you do that, you actually start to bring confusion to your learners because they're they're not quite sure which identity they're supposed to start to be socialized to. We've done a decent job in North America over the last several years with curricular revisions in the formal curriculum around thinking about identities, but our hidden curriculum is huge. 
So we send students to placements, lots of them, where the identities that they're seeing enacted are hugely different than the ones that we're actually teaching them in school. And they are not at a stage, they don't have the cognitive mental maps to be able to say, I learned this identity, I'm seeing this identity, I need to enact this one, and they start to pick up this one, and it becomes a challenge. And so those things actually undo some of the work that we do within the classrooms in our current structures. The other challenge that we have when you look at this across the last century is that right from the mid 1940s, the clinician construct has been given a significant amount of power. And again, from a critical lens, that's not me saying that we don't want to be clinicians or that I'm not supportive of that. The problem when you give so much power to this construct is that it undermines all sorts of pharmacists that don't see themselves in that light. It also creates a disconnect for learners that if they're going to work in a retail setting that we have villainized within our archives and within our literature, that they can't figure out how can they go and work in that role and be this clinical pharmacist. And it creates some of the language barriers that we're starting to see with staff pharmacists and some of the disillusionment that we're seeing and job satisfaction um, across the profession and folks actually being complacent and being re-socialized into older identity constructs in the workplace. Pharmacy actually has data to show that we do get re-socialized in our work environments more than any other profession and way more than medicine. Pharmacists, physicians graduate doctors and they know what that means and then they get socialized within actual specialties, but there's an underlying identity that's common amongst all of them. Pharmacists, we don't have that currently. And if you look at the data, a lot of the workplace socialization actually changes the identities that happen within our educational institutions. And part of the problem is that we don't actually know, there's not enough empiric data to, to, just, to say whether or not we're not teaching the identities adequately or whether it's being undone by practice environments. And we just don't have that data to answer that question. And so ultimately we end up with this clinician way of being, being given legitimacy as a way to reprofessionalize pharmacy. And in doing that, we actually miss potential other ways of being. And so by thinking about it as being one way of being and not necessarily the only way, we open up other ways of thinking about pharmacists. And I'll close with pharmacist identity constructs aren't straightforward, self-evident or progressive. And I think that to put this into a bigger perspective, we need to start to actually study identity and look at the implications for curriculum, the impact of social recognition and interactions with other healthcare providers, faculty development, and the role of feedback for learners to reinforce identities that we're trying to help develop. And that's the end of my first study. Thank you, Dr. Keller. Um, our discussion today is Dr. Nancy Wade. Nancy Wade is a professor and clinical education associate director at the University of Waterloo School of Pharmacy, as well as at the Ontario College of Pharmacists, professor in pharmacy innovation. So Nancy obviously is coming to us online. She also co-leads OPEN, the Ontario Pharmacy Evidence Network, her research program examines the development and assessment of curricula to produce pharmacists prepared to provide medication management in an evolving healthcare landscape, as well as explores the impact of novel pharmacist interventions and pharmacist scope of practice changes on medication management and health outcomes. So Nancy, you have the floor. Thank you very much. So the first thing I'll ask is, can you hear me okay? Because of course our technology needs to be checked. Uh, can you hear me clearly in the room? Yeah, perfectly. Perfect. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So um, I'm sure many of you know when you're asked to speak, the first, maybe not the first, but one of the things at some point that flits through your mind is, you know, why was I asked to speak? What in particular do I bring to this? So I thought, well, let's you know, whatever, this is fine. I'll look through Jamie's slides and see. And so the, the very first thing is she talks about this century long historical view. And I began thinking, am I just the only one in the room that might have a century long historical view? I'm not quite sure what that says. Then the next slide says something about having an identity crisis. And I'm really now beginning to wonder why I have been asked to speak. <laughs> So 
then I realize as I go through how the high level thinking that has happened here, and then I'm just going to pat myself on the back and say, well, she thinks that I might be able to understand actually what she's going to be talking about. So thank you for the invitation uh, to, to look at this. And, and I really, really think this is interesting. I, I, just, I would imagine a lot of people in the room, um, you know, as you read those quotes, if you hadn't seen the date, you would have expected that they would have been certainly 1990s, 2000s easily. And yet, of course, you know, we, we do see that they're from many years ago. And that kind of makes me reflect. And I think that this is what you, you've come to some really interesting uh, conclusions, um, Jamie. I want to talk about two things. Um, and one is, well, both of them, I guess, are about what do we, what can we do with this? And what does this tell us? Um, and and I, I want to kind of challenge us in terms of thinking about really what is next. Um, and I'm, I'm talking about what is that, that next identity? And, and I really like the concept that this is fluid, uh, that this isn't actually a trajectory forward and, and stopping, stop ourselves thinking that way. And, and my two points here are, are one, we're changing to a very different healthcare system. And you know, I bet they said that about 40 years ago as well, but I do think that this, the virtual care, for example, um, is certainly changing how we think about even delivering uh, care to patients. We, we talk about personalized medicine and you know, are we going to need to go back to be medicine makers? Um, we talked about public health and the importance, we're right in the middle of a public health problem, you know, massive issues. You know, is that the role? And we see now we have guidelines for how to manage uh, coronavirus for pharmacists. So it's interesting to me that I look, and I was thinking about the medicine supplier, we're talking about drug shortages and patient safety and how important it really goes back to the elements, main, you know, of dispensing. And I like the fact that maybe we need to go back and, and actually think about how do we embrace some of the things, uh, some of those identities that uh, we have tried to discard along the way. Um, and I and and think and then we have to think in this virtual world of the dispensing is actually not happening in front of the patients; it's arriving by mail. Um, and and I uh, there was one other identity I'd never heard anywhere in there ever, and that was of entrepreneur not business, but entrepreneur in terms of how are we innovative and creative and fluid and in terms of how we deliver those services uh, to our patients. Um, and so I, I'm really curious as to what our language is going to be like over this next 10, 20 years, because I think there's some fairly significant disruptions going to be happening in our industry and it, it made me go back and look at some of those other identities and the words that were used in this more positive light. And uh, I don't know where that means we'll go, but I, I certainly think that's interesting um, to think about, but also to think about that um, um, the word we keep on resilience and that entrepreneurship that may may also uh, form part of our professional identity. And I don't think that's something um, most healthcare professional identities have as a component. So that, that's sort of my one kind of question is, and I, I also wondered, should we be talking about like a core professional identity that, you know, if that's healthcare provider, but then we have plus other identities and, and that might help some of our pharmacists who feel that they, you know, they, they do fall into another category and allow them to sort of own that, that other identity as, as being important. So I wasn't quite sure how I, I would see it going forward, but those were some of my, my initial thoughts on it. The other part of it was, how do we bring this into the classroom? And um, I think that there has been a, a big shift in our curriculum over the last, I would even just say 10 years, and that is to including um, experiential much earlier in our curriculum. And I'm not really sure that we have taken advantage of, of what it offers us. Um, the fact that our students are going out there and seeing practice, um, you know, right away, practically within the first, second, third years, is really probably one of our, of our biggest strengths. Um, and yet, our programs fairly typically move or separate, maybe is the way to put it, separate experiential education from our didactic curriculum. 
And I certainly know here at Waterloo, and I bet it's pretty similar, well, it's been similar to every other school I worked with, that's put it, worked at, that's that's for sure, is that you know we, we assume somebody's gonna arrange experiential and they're gonna go out, um, but I don't think, and we prep them for that, and uh, you know, sometimes students will bring an experience up in the classroom when they're asking a question, but we never really capitalize on it. And, and that idea that, you know, you need to move in your professional identity from doing to being. And, you know, I think that probably the biggest component of that is, well, it can just happen, but we can help move it forward by reflective uh, activities. And one of our most popular things with the students was we used to run, run a seminar program where, um, well, it was obviously people coming in and giving talks for them. It was occurred every semester. We had different themes, but always in that seminar, we had one session where they reflected on their co-op experience and shared it. Um, we had some great little activities for them and they really liked it. When we revised our curriculum to move the Farm D, we dropped that. Um, because it just didn't fit in, we had to reduce what we were doing. And so we really have no formal reflective activities. Um, they do individual reflective activities, but really no chance to, to share and actually understand that professional identity uh, development or what they're seeing out there and how that, I always, I, I like um, creating collisions. You know, really, it, we talk about that being a problem that the students go out and see something different than we're teaching in the classroom and i think we i would argue that's perfect because that's what we need to be able to uh, to work with the students and work help them work through that uh, and that in itself will will help them understand how to be um, different so i would argue that um, experiential education is one of our biggest strengths and one of our biggest tools and yet uh, I think it's probably the one thing in our curriculum that we use least uh, in terms of moving this identity forward. Um, so those are my, my two main comments. Um, I also will just quickly end to say that I actually have experienced this in the family um, where I have a son who uh, has just finished medicine and I have a daughter who is going through pharmacy. And I would argue that um, I think we put medicine on a pedestal a little bit but as I've heard, and of course, I've only got N of two here, N of one in medicine, and, and but I listen to their, their classmates as they're talking in the house, et cetera, is that they, they both have a lot of shifting to do in terms of being able to form that professional identity. Um, I would argue actually that physicians have it thrust upon them. Um, I would argue that pharmacists have to figure it out. Um, I'm not sure that one is actually necessarily completely better. I see my son rejecting aspects of that professional identity, um, but yet he doesn't really have a choice. Um, he's expected to behave a certain way. I see my daughter navigating that and figuring out what is it that best fits her uh, and her, her skill set or her personality and her interests and what she wants to do. Um, and so I, I also, think we should look at this not just as it's a negative yes we may not have a very clear professional identity but is there a, the identity pro, uh, the formation of an identity part of our education that actually can be turned into a positive and maybe in the end might serve patients better if we are able to embrace different identities maybe name them better and not get so caught up in one's better than another, but is that actually a direction that we may want to go? So I'll just leave it at that, but thank you very much, Jamie. I, this really got me thinking quite a bit and uh, I'm really interested in hearing everybody's questions. Thank you. All right, so we are now open for questions from the audience in person or online. Does anybody wish to ask a question or make a comment? So can you speak really loudly? Cause I'm not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Ayan. <laughs> so, I think that's an interesting question. And in my second study that's almost ready to be uh, sent out, it's still there. And this is actually another way of looking at uh, pharmacist identity and how they perceive their own identity is actually my next study. Um, but what's interesting is that oh, the question was, why do pharmacists go back to the apothecary identity in such a nostalgic tone and Jen asked if we maybe romanticize it and because many of us don't actually even remember those days. So part of the challenge from an identity perspective currently in the pharmacy literature and from the pharmacy profession that makes us unique is that the shifting identities in pharmacy have been a requirement because of the impact of societal transformation in a way that other professions haven't done it. And sort of taking it back to some of the things that Nancy said, Nancy, I actually think that all of these identities is a good thing. I use a critical social theory lens, but thinking about Fiona Webster, uh, critical theory, it doesn't mean criticize. Um, and so it's to exactly what you've done, sort of poke holes at other ways of thinking about things and making other things possible and attractive. So I don't know that we wanna be like medicine. In fact, I would argue we don't. I don't think that we need to seek one identity. And in fact, I think there are many that we may want to explore. But I think part of our challenge is to think about how we do it proactively and purposefully. And one of the issues with professional identity in pharmacy is that in 1915, Abraham Flexner said that pharmacy wasn't a profession in a big speech that was published after the 1910 Flexner report. And this is throughout the entire archive from is pharmacy a profession? Dingwall has written papers on it. Pharmacy has been called an occupation. We've been called a quasi profession. We've been, there's a number of papers out of the UK um, that talk about the reprofessionalization of pharmacy, like somehow we lost it. And so if you look at identity and why we've latched onto the clinician structure for so long, it's because it's so close to medicine and medicine's the top of the hierarchy, whether we agree or disagree. There's an element of trying to take their scope that makes us more legitimate and somehow professional. And so if you look in the archive, and again, I'm not making this up, it's just how the archive presents it. The apothecary is associated, and again, I use a social constructivist lens. In society, the apothecary was at the pinnacle of professions and professions have a very, important place in society, they always have. I think what we're seeing now as a society is a little bit of re or sort of deprofessionalization across the board. Society is looking at professionals differently than they did years ago and everyone is coming down, but pharmacy has an advantage and I actually have tried to use pharmacy as a case study in a positive lens. This is gonna happen to family medicine because society is changing the roles of what people do. This is happening to radiology. A radiologist's job is much different now and one would argue, how many do we need now because of technology? So this notion of societal transformations impacting professions is huge, but pharmacy has viewed that historically as a downgrading of the profession and we're somehow less than, and our response to that has been visionary rhetoric attached to getting closer to doctors. And my argument is that don't be that, pick our own thing and be it, whether medicine agrees or not. But the problem is we've been so closely related and we started out from the same place, particularly in sort of those early days across all of the Commonwealth countries, that those ties have been really close and sort of we always na navigate back to that. So the data always compares us and that's a challenge. So I think the nostalgia is that all of this identity work in pharmacy, what's fascinating to me is that in all of the data, pharmacy education is the savior. The fix to the reprofessionalization, the, the, if you read AJPE, Every decade, there's a series of papers that start with words that start with RE, reprofessionalize, revolutionize, reinstitute, rethink, reimagine, redefine. We've re everything the profession over the last hundred years, yet the profession is almost the same in many cases. So I think it's how it's wrapped up in the archive that I've read. Thank you. It's so really exciting. <laughs> Any other questions or are there any questions online? Anne. 
Anne's saying she's graduated almost 50 years ago and we're celebrating that. That's not a sad thing. Good job, Anne. Absolutely. So Anne was just relating back to her own progression through the um, through her own pharmacy career and sort of highlighting some of the things that have come up, those comparisons to, to medicine, this notion of seeking clinical pharmacy having been certainly talked about when you were first graduating, and the change in perception of the media. What's interesting about the media, though, is that in the study that I'm working on now, there's a very strong identity of what I'm not sure what to call, but it's sort of this unremarkable character that most people don't know that pharmacists are pharmacists. And so this notion of in the media, we're always the one that's diverting the narcotics or um, doing something a little bit sketchy, or you can't quite see us, or the hospital pharmacist in the basement and the drug get just appear from somewhere. So there's a lot of notion around this hidden role, an important role, but there's not always a face to it um, that I think we're still making strides to in improve and media certainly certainly plays a big role. So you've hit on my next identity title in my next paper, which I call the aspirational clinician. We aspire to, but can't because, um, and there's a number of reasons for because. You've highlighted one related to organizational structure and legislation. I think you can't deny that that has an impact. Um, but again, I, I challenge you to think about, so yes, I think those things have a play a role, but even in some cases when we try to get to past those, practice will only change when we as individuals say, I will be this way and we change. So if we keep, defaulting to I can't be this then we'll never be and I think that's part of the issue um, I think when you think about the the rotations and I know Nancy talked about the experiential as well the the problem is not necessarily that students go into a into a rotation that's different than what we teach in school and I agree with Nancy that that sort of disconnect is important but from an educational perspective where we fall down is we don't do any debriefs on that 
we don't pre-brief and debrief. Like we're sending you to EPE1 and some of these environments won't look like what we've taught. Here's how you can navigate that. And then when they come back, we don't say, tell me what you saw and let's reenact it. When you look at the very limited literature around identity formation in pharmacy education specific, one of the things that students say frequently is, we've made this big movement to hire more clinical faculty. Yay, I'm one of those. So I, I applaud that new clinical movement. It makes positions like mine possible. But one of the challenges is even in our labs, and I'm guilty of this, I taught a simulation lab um, for a number of years. We bring in pharmacists to assess students to work with simulated patients. We put them in a room, the actor acts out a case, they do a good job, we tell them how they did. We're all pharmacists in the room, not one of us plays out the encounter with them. So when you're forming an identity, part of the developmental piece, if you think about it from a developmental psychology piece, is the notion of you need to have these cognitive destructions or these sort of crises events to allow you to drop an identity and move into the new one. And so in medicine, there's an identity of medical student, there's an identity of clerk, there's an identity of resident, there's an identity of R1 to R5, and then there's an attending identity. And each one has a crisis point that allows you to shift to the other, that includes a lot of briefs and debriefs in that trajectory. We don't even in our own lab setting say, here's what you've done, watch me do it, so that the student can watch themselves and then watch an actual pharmacist to pharmacists do it to create some kind of different way of being. So we need to help them along if we're going to count on our students with their new training to change practice from a curricular perspective. But I also would say I challenge us to think outside that clinical box. And when I do that, I, it's not to say that we shouldn't provide clinical services. We surely should. But we're always looking for the next identity, thinking about from the healthcare lens. What if you drop the healthcare lens? For us, it's just natural at U of T to be a health faculty. What if we weren't? What if we joined phys ed? What if we joined Rotman and said we're entrepreneurs instead of pretending that we don't care about business? And, and in doing that, you start to see different ways for the profession to move forward, all of them potentially being legitimate ways to serve society to improve health. But it's a bigger way of thinking. But when you get down that progressive, I must be a clinician because that's where healthcare providers have legitimacy, we seek out expanded scope that looks like doctors. We all want to prescribe. A million people can. So what else can we do that still serves society? And so I'm just asking different questions. I have more questions now than I have any answers for it, let me tell you. I got years worth of work. Okay, one more question. Oh, okay, one question online. Sorry. Hmm. How do I think PharmaCare will change or give pharmacists new roles? I think it depends how it plays out. <laughs> um, I think with anything, there's huge opportunity. Um, and I think it's going to depend how pharmacists show up and sort of how we take a lead on these kinds of activities. It took pharmacy as a profession years to have a statement on pharmacare. All of the other professions were out of the gate, but we, we spend so much time trying to craft some kind of statement that we all agree with versus just getting something out there, even if it causes some kind of reaction. So I think this came through in the literature and I didn't put it in this study because it's just too much. But pharmacy doesn't help themselves. As a profession, we're more disjointed than any. We don't have a common voice across our associations. We don't have common mandates. That doesn't mean they all have to align, but there's a lot of inner conflict within the North American professional world of pharmacy. And that comes through in the archive significantly. It would have been a paper on its own and I just couldn't tackle it here, but certainly there is a discourse around the lack of um, connection with us as a group and a lot of disconnect between community and hospital pharmacy as well falls into that with very different lines of allyship, which hurt the profession moving forward. But I don't have good answers on that part of it. So I think the pharmacare thing, huge opportunities, but it's gonna depend how we show up and what we do with it and we need to find a unified way to lead in this space um, that we all buy into, or at least for the most part. Okay, thank you everyone for your participation and thank you especially to Jamie for uh, stimulating our uh, thoughts and uh, stimulating a lot more discussion I can see as we go along. And thank you Nancy for your comments. Um, I think we could probably spend a few days discussing this. Um, and this is a small token of appreciation for your presentation today. Thank and you, Tadella. <laughs> thanks, everyone, for attending. Thank you.